Hello, and welcome to tonight's ASMR video. This is a sequel to my first ASMR show and tell of the Magic the Gathering Art of Innistrad book. Tonight we'll be looking at the final chapters of the book and the coming of Emrakul. Avacyn's Fate At the end of the last video, we looked at Liliana Vess and the Gate Watch. We didn't reach the Gate Watch quite yet, but we did talk about Liliana, her quest for power, and her pact between four mighty demons which gave her eternal life. It was the attempt to destroy the demons that brought her to the plain of Innistrad to confront the demon Grizzlebrand. Let's look at the members of the Gate Watch now. Jace Balerin. In his youth, on the plain of Rin, Jace's natural telepathic talents were in turn misunderstood and exploited. He was alienated and harassed for being different, lacking the physical strength to defend himself. Then he was manipulated and betrayed by the powerful Sphinx Mind Mage, who taught him to control his magic. In the process of freeing himself from being the Sphinx's pawn, Jace badly damaged his own mind as his planeswalker spark ignited, sending him to another plane with only a fragmentary recollection of his own identity. During this time, he formed a romantic attachment to Liliana Bess, only to learn that she too was manipulating and deceiving him. After defeating two of the Eldrazi Titans on Zendikar, Jace took an oath to keep watch over the planes of the multiverse as part of the Gate Watch. He already holds a similar role on his adopted home plane, Ravnica, where he is the living guild pack who keeps the ten guilds of that city plane in balance. But the Gate Watch offers him the opportunity to think and act on a larger scale, which intrigues him as a mental challenge, in addition to appealing to his sense of responsibility. Jace can't walk away from an unsolved mystery. He believes everything that exists can be understood and he dreams of one day knowing everything there is to know. On Zendikar he learned the history of the Eldrazi from Ugin, the spirit dragon, and he burns with the desire to know more about them, which brought him to Innistrad in search of Sorin Markov. His visit to the plain is complicated by his relationship with Liliana Bess. Given their past romance, he is attracted to her and cares about her, but he doesn't trust her at all. This is Tamio, the Moon Sage. Although not part of the Gate Watch, Tamio would come to aid the members of the Gate Watch in their investigations and actions on Innistrad. Gideon Jura. Gideon Jura drew, grew up on the plain of Theros, where he developed from a young ruffian into a great hero trained in the magical art of hieromancy, the magic of law. But hubris led to his fall. He was sent by the sun god of Theros, Heliod, to destroy a rampaging titan serving Erebos, god of the dead. After he and the ragtag soldiers who followed him, his irregulars, killed the titan, Gideon went one step further and tried to destroy Erebos himself. The result of Gideon's hubris was the death of his irregulars. This tragedy caused his Pelane's walker spark to ignite. Gideon feels responsible for other people and believes that he must protect anyone who can't protect themselves. This impulse led him to battle the Eldrazi on Zendikar. And after a tremendous victory, 
His commitment to standing watch over all the planes of the multiverse led to the formation of the Gate Watch. Nissa Ravain, and this is Nissa. Nissa Ravain is an elf from the plain of Zendikar. In her youth, horrible visions haunted her, which proved to be a glimpse of the pain that Zendikar was suffering as a result of the Eldrazi's presence. The plain's plea for help. Nissa answered that plea and vowed to help Zendikar, but a horrific glimpse of Emrakul lying imprisoned beneath the mountains speared through Nissa's mind, igniting her spark and hurling her away from her own plane. To Nissa, planes are living beings inhabiting the multiverse, not pieces that make it up. She can see the connection between all living things, and she believes these connections extend in a great pattern across the multiverse. She can communicate with the soul of planes, and she sees it as her duty to convey their words to others who can't hear their voices. After delivering Zendikar from the contagion of the Eldrazi, she is determined to help other planes that suffer in similar ways. Chandra Nala, this is Chandra. On her home plane of Kaladesh, Chandra Nala was the daughter of innovative artificers who were known for finding clever ways to circumvent the authoritarian consulate. Chandra's ambition and impulsiveness, though, inevitably led her into conflict with the consulate. Cornered by consulate soldiers, her innate magical talent sparked to life, manifesting in consuming flames that wreaked havoc beyond Chandra's ability to control them. Eventually captured and sentenced to execution, Chandra was suddenly blasted out of Kaladesh when her planeswalker spark ignited, leaving an inferno in her wake. Impetuous and hot-tempered, Chandra has a fierce sense of justice. She hates to see figures and structures of authority suppressing people's rights to freedom and self-expression, and she tends to express her indignation with fiery actions first and words later. She joined the Gate Watch as a way to fight against tyranny in any form, to ensure that people across the multiverse could live free. Shadows over Innistrad. Avacyn's emergence from the Hell Vault brought a renewed surge of hope to the beleaguered human populace of Innistrad. But even as Avacyn and her angels were driving back the monsters of the Nahite, Nahiri, also newly liberated from the Moon Silver Prison, set in motion her plans for revenge against Sorin, who left her to languish in the Hell Vault for a thousand years. Called the Lithomancer, Nahiri was a master of the magic of stone, and she created twisted stones across the plain to alter the flow of mana through the land. She focused this mana towards a single point off the coast of Nefalia, where she and her allies constructed a monumental stone temple. And there, the concentrated punic of mana began to tear open a hole in the plain, summoning one of the Eldrazi titans from the blind eternities to destroy Sorin's home plain. A side effect of Nahiri's manipulation of mana, unintended but not unwelcome, was the strain it placed on the minds of Avacyn and her angels. The combination of the altered ley lines and Emrakul's slow approach through the ether ultimately broke Avacyn's mind, and thus madness swept across the world as the fleeting hope of angelic protection was transformed into horror. Once the protector of Innistrad, Avacyn began terrorizing the people of the plain. Crazed angels, their wings and weapons spattered with blood, brought fire from the sky down upon a small village near Thraben. Houses burned, people were reduced to ash, and refugees fled screaming into the night. In her madness, Avacyn came to believe that protecting Innistrad meant purging it of humans as well as the evil forces she was meant to keep it in check. In the same way that the body's immune system reacts to infection, the angels, created as protectors for the plane, were thrown into a chaotic fury by the corruption infecting Innistrad. Viewing humans, werewolves and vampires alike as a plague, Avacyn, in her more violent phases, brought utter annihilation upon human dwellings and settlements. The angels left blackened scars across the land where villages once stood. Nessa 
Nahiri recruited the ghoul caller Jiza to help her, channeling Jiza's destructive impulses towards her own purposes. Jiza raised a huge crew of ghouls from the wreckage of a ship off the Nefalian coast and put the zombies to work hauling rock and building what she called the Drownyard Temple. With construction of the Drownyard Temple underway, Nahiri finally sets, let Sorin know that her vengeance was at hand. Travelling to his ancestral home in Stenzia, she transformed the manor and killed the vampires inside, embedding them into the walls as she tore the manor apart and reshaped it into a great stone pattern. Then she returned to Nefalia and waited. Heedless of Liliana's warnings, Jace found his way to Markov Manor, but what he discovered was completely unexpected. In the heights overlooking Cruin Pass, the manor had been transformed into a gravity-defying pattern of floating stonework. The promontory on which it was built had crumbled into a narrow path of floating stones supported by empty air. Towers, halls and buttresses hung at odd angles around the sundered core of the manor building. Carefully traversing the broken stone, Jace found a ghastly scene inside the manor. The inner structures of the building were transformed like those outside, but faces and limbs protruded from the walls at odd angles that suggested the strange patterns outside. Countless Markov vampires were dead, embedded in the stone walls of their ancestral home. Drawn onward in horrid fascination, Jace finally discovered one clue to the mystery unfolding before him. Among all the vampires, one human was encased in stone, one protruding hand clutching a slender book bound in silk. Freeing the book from its owner's cold grasp, he recognised the writing of the moon folk of Kamigawa. Painstakingly deciphering the script, he learned the private thoughts of another planeswalker who was investigating the strange events on the plane, but the clues contained in the journal posed more questions than they answered. Written by the moon folk planeswalker Tamio, the journal detailed her research into the flow of mana through the lands of Innistrad. Tamio observed that the mana flow had an effect on the behaviour of Avacyn and her angels, and she reported what she was able to learn about the origin of Avacyn, that Sorin Markov created the archangel to protect Innistrad and its people. Connecting these two facts, Jace realised that the madness of the angels might be connected to Sorin. He reasoned that retracing Tamio's steps might reveal clues to Sorin's location. This is Sorin in the ruins of Markov Manor, with all the vampires melding with stonework. Following the stones to the rocky coast of Nefalia, Jace discovered a great stone ring encircled by more of the twisted cryptoliths. The immense structure emerged from the water near the wreckage of a huge trade ship. Hordes of zombies carried massive stones from shore and laid them in place to build what looked like an eldritch temple dedicated to some elder god of the sea. Jace hid in the shadows, watching the zombies toil as angels wheeled in the sky overhead, madly circling the structure like moths around a flame. The presence of the zombies infuriated Jace. Though Innistrad had more than its fair share of ghoul callers, he strongly suspected Liliana's involvement in this mess. This seemed to explain her behaviour at their first meeting, where she had warned him off looking for Sorin, as if she were hiding a guilty secret. He suspected that she had turned Avacyn against the, the angel's original purpose, and perhaps against Sorin himself, so he resolved to confront Liliana again. At this point, he was driven by an inquisitiveness that had come to border on this obsession. In fact, Nahiri was channeling the mana of the plane towards her drownyard temple in order to summon Emrakul from the blind eternities and destroy Innistrad. The zombies were not Liliana's work, but that of the ghoul caller Jiza, who had abandoned her rivalry with her brother to aid the lithomancer's efforts.
Jace sought out Avacyn in the heart of Thraban Cathedral. The cathedral was distorted in much the same way as Markov Manor, solidifying Jace's belief that Avacyn was the key to finding Sorin, and he snuck past its guardians, both Cathars of the church and Avacyn's archangels, to reach the innermost chambers. There he found Tamio, the moonfolk planeswalker who had written the journal. After sending Jenrick to Markov Manor with her journal in hand to confirm her suspicions about alterations to the mana flow through Stenzia, Tamio's own investigations had eventually led her to Thraben Cathedral. While she quietly observed, staying beneath the angel's notice, Jace stormed into the archangel's loft ready for a confrontation. Seeing Jace's frantic obsession, Tamio invited him to touch the stillness of her mind, which he did. In the alien but serene passages of the moon sage's thoughts, Jace found the calm he needed to confront Avacyn, and not a moment too soon. Avacyn appeared and attacked. Jace and Tamio joined forces to battle the Archangel, with Tamio fighting Avacyn in the air while Jace helped from the ground. It was a fierce struggle, and Avacyn was more powerful than either planeswalker expected. At first, Jace believed that he could trick or immobilize Avacyn. He was wrong. Normal angel minds are alien enough. But Avacyn's mind was a maze of turbulence that even Jace could not handle. Undaunted by the planeswalker's mental attacks, Avacyn unleashed her angelic fury upon Jace and Tamio. The cathedral itself began to crumble and her her relenting result, knocking Tamio to the ground, and Jace ended up flat on his back, Avacyn's deadly spear poised to strike him through the heart. Sorin arrived just in time to prevent Avacyn from killing Jace. Sorin and Avacyn fought an epic battle inside the cathedral. While the two battled, Jace created an illusory diversion to keep the remaining angels and Cathars busy while he waited to confront Sorin. Sorin had made Avacyn, and only he could stop her. He knew that she was destroying the balance he had created her to maintain. Aware that she had been purging humans and vampires alike, Sorin had been agonizing about what he had to do, but Olivia Voldaren's demand had made his choice clear, and the time to act had come. To save Innistrad, he had to unmake his creation. There was more to their relationship than just creator and creation. Sorin had put something of himself into the angel, and the decision to unmake Avacyn caused him terrible grief. Ultimately, Sorin and the angel ended up in the vault of the archangel where Avacyn was created. Sorin unmade Avacyn, undoing his act of creation, and she was gone from the world. With Avacyn's destruction, the last of the protections woven over in Estrad were broken. Not only did destroying Avacyn not solve the problems facing the plane, it made things worse. In the absence of Avacyn, the way was finally paved for Emrakul to enter in Estrad. Jace had finally found Sorin, and he confronted the vampire planeswalker after Avacyn's destruction. He wanted to know why Sorin hadn't come to Zendikar to help Ugin when the Eldrazi broke free, and he urged the vampire to return to Zendikar with him to find and destroy the remaining Eldrazi. Sorin suddenly realized the full extent of what had been happening. Almost oblivious to Jace's questions, he realized that Nahiri had been warping the stones and reshaping the ley lines, and that she was almost certainly summoning one of the Eldrazi to the plain. And he had played right into her plan by destroying Avacyn, casting down the last barrier that stood between Innistrad and the Eldrazi's insatiable hunger. Just as Sorin tried to communicate this information, Jace's head exploded in pain as Emrakul entered the plain at last. The Coming of Emrakul Emrakul is the largest and most fearsome of the three Eldrazi titans that were imprisoned on Zendikar. She causes silent horror wherever she soars, embodying desolation, emotional and physical distance, the chill of the void, and the terror of being alone. Thus, in many ways, she is perfectly at home on Innistrad. 
Even the approach of Emrakul pressed on the minds of Innistrad's inhabitants, straining their sanity, and her full manifestation amplified the effect. Cultists who bordered on mad obsession descended into gibbering adulation of their Eldrazi idol, and scholars who pried into dark secrets fell catatonic with the full realization of the alien horror they had seen. Emrakul arrived in Innistrad without her brood of drones and other spawn, so she immediately began warping the natural and unnatural native creatures of Innistrad in her monstrous image. Beings transformed into Emrakul's spawn manifested fleshy lattice structures, distorted symmetry, and tentacles ending in knobby vestigial digits. Those who had already begun their descent into corruption before the Eldrazi's arrival were warped almost beyond recognition, but even those who fought against the madness during her approach were susceptible to the life-warping affects of her presence. Emrakul's arrival set a new series of horrific events in motion, as humans and monsters alike found their very existence threatened by this blasphemous horror. This is a wretched griff, a creature twisted into tentacled monstrosity by Emrakul. The death of Avacyn didn't really solve anything as far as the angels were concerned. Just as the angels were the first to go mad as Emrakul drew near, they were the first to experience the life-warping effects of the Eldrazi's full presence on the plain. Drizella and Bruna, the two archangels who joined Avacyn in her madness, fused together into a huge Eldrazi monstrosity with two heads, four wings, and a tangled mass of limbs resembling the tentacles of Emrakul herself. The rest of the angels in Cavoni were similarly transformed into Eldrazi drones. Under Emrakul's influence, the fused Eldrazi archangel, called Brizella, voice of nightmares, took over both the Skurzdag and Lunark Inquisition to help the Eldrazi feed. The demon worshipper Jerin and the rest of the Lunark Council were killed, and the demon Ormondal was transformed into an, into an Eldrazi horror like the angels. The sight of angels and demons working together alongside Cathars and heretics, all under the Eldrazi's control, was a clear sign of the doom that had come to Innistrad. Here are more of Emrakul's monsters. Eldritch Moon. Sorin's destruction of Avacyn opened a path for an even greater horror to come to Innistrad. Even in her madness, the Archangel had given the plane a measure of protection, a metaphysical barrier that had prevented Emrakul from manifesting in physical form on Innistrad. But with her destruction, all of Nahiri's plans came to a terrible fulfilment. As the w protective wards fell, Emrakul breached the barriers between planes and emerged off the Nefalian coast. The Eldrazi Titan floated up the coastline, leaving life warped and mutated into insane and incomprehensible forms in her wake. Fortunately for Innistrad, the plane still had its defenders. Jace summoned the other members of the Gatewatch to face Emrakul, and they met the Titan in Thraben as the city came under attack from thousands of warped cultists and mutated creatures. Then, with help from unexpected allies, the planeswalker combines their efforts 
in a last desperate attempt to trap Emrakul forever. With the fall of Avmasin, Emrakul, or a physical manifestation of the extra planar being, rose from the ocean in Nahiri's drownyard temple, all according to Nahiri's plan. As the titan fully materialised and rose up, greeted by a chorus of gibbering cultists, her influence intensified, warping the shape and substance of living flesh and vegetation. The mad cultists and crazed angels at Emrakul's side took on new and horrible forms, their mutated bodies transforming further into the likeness of the Eldrazi. Emrakul hovered over the temple for a time, feasting on the mana that Nahiri's cryptoliths channeled toward that place. As she fed, her influence spread out along the ley lines, infecting most of the plain with her terrible corruption. Then the Eldrazi began to drift up the coast towards Thraben, where the cathedral stood, above another nexus of magical power she could drain, while extending her influence along other lines of power. All along the coast, mutated cultists, transformed beasts and nameless monstrosities were drawn toward her from miles around, and the coastal villages of Nephalia were left abandoned in her wake. The Battle of Markov Manor With Emrakul's arrival, Nahiri's ultimate revenge was unleashed on Innistrad. The details were of no great concern to her. She expected Emrakul to unleash a tidal wave of dis- devastation and ultimately consume the plane. She felt no need to watch the Eldrazi feed on Innistrad, but she wanted to watch Sorin suffer to see him feel small and helpless. So she gathered a coterie of mad and flesh-warped cultists, fanatics and horrors, and returned to Markov Manor to await the inevitable confrontation with Sorin. The two planeswalkers met before the grotesque doorway of Markov Manor and all else was forgotten. As vampire knights charged into the gibbering throng of Nahiri's minions, Sorin and the Lithomancer joined in a furious duel. Sorin and Nahiri were each older than almost any other living creature, Hairs of different times, when the spark brought almost godlike power. Though their potency was diminished from what it had been centuries ago, the magical might brought to bear in their personal battle dwarfed the combined forces that fought around them. Both vampires and Eldrazi horrors gave them a wide berth, or fell lifeless to the ground with barely a thought from either planeswalker. Impelled by her fury, Nahiri fought fiercely and overwhelmed her former mentor. Battering Sorin with broken shards of his own ancestral manor, she wore down his strength and soon pinned him to the ground. Finally, as her cultists drove the vampires away in a rout, the lithomancer encased Sorin in a cocoon of stone. Just as Sorin had imprisoned her in the hell vault, she trapped Sorin so that he could watch the destruction of his own plane, unable to lift a finger in its defence. After Emrakul appeared on Innistrad, Jace returned to Zendikar to gather Gideon and the rest of the Planeswatch. After reconvening at the ruins of Seagate, the four Planeswalkers journeyed together to Innistrad. They arrived first at the Drownyard Temple, where they saw the madness and devastation left in Emrakul's wake, similar to and yet utterly unlike the physical corruption of Zendikar wrought by the other Eldrazi Titans. Emrakul's arrival at the High City seemed to spend, spell the end for all of Innistrad. The Gatewatch caught up to Emrakul at Thraben, but every crazed cultist and deformed monstrosity from miles around had also come to the city. Hordes of them swarmed the capital, and the defences of the city broke under the assault. Gideon shone as the battle captain of the Gatewatch, standing as a human bulwark against waves of enemies and pointing his allies towards weaknesses in the enemy ranks. But with a growing sense of horror, the planeswalkers realised they weren't able to kill Emrakul in the same way that they had killed the titans on Zendikar. There, Nyssa had been able to channel the soul of the plane itself, but Innistrad didn't offer the same elemental power. Jace's ability to shield the others was starting to falter. Soon, the Gatewatch was overrun, and they hadn't even been able to get close to Emrakul. All seemed lost. As the Gatewatch teetered on the brink of defeat, an army of zombies poured through the breaches in the high city walls. At first Gideon was almost overcome with dismay, thinking that more enemies had joined the fray. 
but the ghouls began attacking and destroying the Eldrazi horrors that thronged the streets and held the gate watch surrounded, heedless of the terrible toll the Eldrazi exacted on them. Even as her zombies fell, Liliana raised fallen Cathars to rejoin the battle. Since the undead were immune to the mutations brought about by Emrakul's presence, the zombies helped turn the tide of battle. With the Eldrazi falling back in disarray and Emrakul drawing near, Liliana joined the other planeswalkers at the heart of the battle. A ring of zombies encircled them, shielding them from the Eldrazi that still pressed the attack. In a moment of relative stillness, Liliana still greeted her old friend Jace and her comrades. Emrakul was approaching, and the mental bastions that Jace had created to shield himself and the rest of the Gatewatch were beginning to crumble. And then the clouds parted and revealed a full moon gleaming in the sky above the ruins of Avacyn's cathedral. As Emrakul drew closer, a renewed, sense of deranged, a, new, a renewed surge of deranged cultists and gibbering Eldrazi horrors assaulted the planeswalkers. Gideon and Chandra took up defensive positions among Liliana's zombies to shield the others as they worked out a desperate plan. All Tamio's study of the moon had pointed her toward one important truth. The Hell Vault was a fragment of the moon, and its power to imprison demons represented just a tiny sliver of what the moon could hold. Jace understood immediately, combining Tamio's insight with what he had learned from Ugin about Zendikar's Hedron network. Nyssa reached deep into the barren, corrupted soul of Innistrad itself. Combining all their knowledge and magical power, the three planeswalkers cast a mighty spell that shook the foundations of the plane. As Avacyn's motto said, what cannot be destroyed will be bound. The tremendous power of the planeswalker's magic drew Emrakul into the moon, transforming the moon into a giant hell vault that would keep the Eldrazi bound forever. And the last page we're going to look at is Liliana's Oath. Liliana said, I see that together we're more powerful than we are alone. If that means I can do what needs to be done without relying on the chain veil, then I'll keep watch. Happy now? So the ranks of the Gatewatch expanded, as Liliana vowed to keep watch beside the others, and the five planeswalkers began to look for the next great threat that demanded their attention. I hope you enjoyed that. Sleep well, and good night.